Tell me how that's translated into your third phase, as you call yeah. it before, yeah. life. How do, you, how do you translate winning or goals or, you know, what you're aiming for now, given that that was so specific yeah, at, yeah. during that period? I don't have anywhere near the same level of, um, be, of focus to something because it's not the same outcome and it's also not the same pressure. So you don't have that, well, if you don't make that deadline, you don't win the tournament. <laughs> it's yeah. just not like that. So, um, for example, um, you know, I've just finished my cookbook and you know I wrote the another another book um so things like that it's you know I set the deadlines I set the goals and it's about completing it and it's about all the things that go with it and so that provides an enormous amount of satisfaction but it's not winning and I don't feel like I'm I'm out to win or anything like that it's more about the process and I I love what I'm doing I love that it's been a wonderful journey Mm -hmm. and I love um, bringing something into completion. So even when I was studying, you know, I loved when I'd finished a research paper or I'd finished an assignment or, you know, I'd put something together. Or, so that that provides an enormous amount of satisfaction. And I love the pressure of having to do something and finish it and, and do all the fine little bits and pieces. But it's, yeah, it's not the same as... as a tournament because the pressure is just so intense. Mm. Are you competing against anyone now in your mind? No. Just God, no. yourself. Yeah, I wouldn't even say it's competing. Yeah. I just feel like I'm just driven because I love doing things. Yeah. So, And I guess I have quite a high level of, um, well, I have a high level of enthusiasm, which is one of my strengths and one of my weaknesses because I'll do too many things. Yeah. Um, and a level of I want to, like there's something I want to achieve. So it might be what it is. It's not so much about oh, I've got to find something to achieve, aspire to. Yeah. It's more like oh, I'm, you know, I'd love to write a cookbook. Mm-hmm. Actually, I think I could do that. I'll map mm-hmm. out a plan and then, okay, let's do it and then mm-hmm. we'll run with it. And then, you know, I love that there's this journey that goes with it and it changes and we craft it and it, then it becomes its own thing. And and so that's something that I, yeah, I love. And I love being able to be creative and come up with other ways to support that and, um yeah, I find that really exciting. But the enthusiasm is something I've always been, has been a bit of a problem. So when I was competing, I always wanted to do more. Like I'd find, oh, I'm going to do stair training. I'm going to do plyometrics. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And so that served me well on one hand, but then often made me tired or I'd overtrain or, you know, I'll just do an individual session because I want to perfect this kick. I love this kick, you know. So it was also being able to keep that in check yeah. and go, okay, well, Let's not do that many sessions this week. Let's yeah. span it over some time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who do you think's been your most ardent supporter? Um, well, definitely my parents, you know. That, and But then I feel like, you know, it wouldn't have mattered what I was doing if I was, you know, collecting rubbish or as, <laughs> as long as I was happy, they'd be happy. So I feel like they always supported me. But they were never like showbiz parents and driving me to training or I always, you know, got lifts with someone else and, you know, found a way to get to training, you know, before I was driving and could get myself there. And I just feel like they just loved what, that I was happy and mm-hmm. so I guess I guess them. But I also feel like my some of my friends, and I've got, you know, some really close friends, and they, again, they supported me in a way that I felt a lot of love because I knew that, like, say, my best friend, for example, Amy, she... You know, she didn't want to see me um, struggling and dropping weight and didn't want to see me in the ring, but she knew that I loved it, so she supported me a lot. Um, and then another friend of mine, a really close friend of mine, Sal, who I lived with, she under- knew what it was like to be an athlete because she'd been an athlete herself. And one of the things that she, I guess, really ha- what helped me um, was... She would just laugh at things. She'd just see the funny side of things or when things were going really pear-shaped or they were bad or injuries or, you know, she would just always, I don't know, make, you know, make a joke of something and make... And, that, you know, laughter is, you know, some of the best medicine. It would just sometimes catapult me out of the seriousness of everything because, you know, for me it was all, oh, I'm not going to make this tournament, I've got to have another... Or I can't train for one day, you know. Yeah. It was... In, I, I can't even believe that now that that was so, but I couldn't think I could, you know, let alone have a week off. I'd think, oh, my God, I I could never compete again if I have a week (laughs) off, you know. It's just so crazy. Warped. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It is another world. Like, 
and I, I actually put something together um, in my naturopathy business, and I've done some um, work clinics on it, is treating athletes because athletes have a very different mindset. They are in this bubble of what they're doing and they can only see in a certain way because they're so focused on, on what they're doing. So it's an interesting way of, of treating them. And they'll, they'll find what they need to so that they can do what they want to do. So, mm. you know, if they go to the physio and the physio says, mm, I just think you should have a week off, and then they'll go to someone else and some other physio will say, no, I reckon if we strap it and we ice it and we do this, we can, we, you can train through that. They'll be like, oh, okay, so I'm taking that advice, you know, so they can keep going and going and going and going. And it's, it's not always, they don't always make wise choices because of that. Mm. Yeah. I want to talk a bit about coach. And what's required of someone to be a great coach? Yeah. We talked about being a good athlete before. What means, you know, what does a good athlete mean? But yeah. what, is, what is a great coach in your mind? I had a lot of coaches and I think that was a, a real strength for me. And, and as I, I talked about earlier about seeking out different people. So, you know, I had my, um, the national coach, Jin Tae Jong, and he was very, you know, came from that Korean background, very technical and, you know, work hard, train hard and, you know, then the technical proficiency comes from that. Then I had my club coach, Martin Hall, who also came to the Olympics with us. And he, he brought a lot more about the mindset and, you know, he would reenact situations with me about being in the ring, you know, like how, are, how do you, like if you were in the ring right now at the Olympics, how would you, would you be fighting like that? You know, I'm like training it, I'm exhausted or whatever. So he kind of helped me to really feel in every fibre of my body um, what it was like being at the ring and sort of taking me to that that place. So, you know, I think every there's lots of... You can draw something from lots of people. So I think being a great coach, you know, Jinte brought a lot of, you know, technical strengths and then Martin had this other thing where he combined the technical and also the ring, the strategy and the game plan and then the mental aspect. And then there, I had my sports psychologists... So I had a couple and they all brought different different strengths. And I mentioned earlier about Noel Blundell and the lights. And we actually, when we were in, at the Olympic Village, we went out and we went to Canberra. We went to the AIS for a week. And we went kicking and screaming and we didn't want to leave the Olympic Village. And But finally when we got there, we realised that it was the best thing. And when I was there, I ran into Noel and he said, I've got the lights here, do you want to have a go? And I was like, oh, yeah, great. So I actually measured my times were the fastest I'd ever had in the eight years or whatever I'd seen him. And so he bought... What I found that someone like Noel did or Jeff, you know, the sports psychologist, was they kind of led me to my own Mm self-discovery. So he didn't say to me, we're going to do this exercise on the lights and this is what you're going to get out of it. But he slowly led me to, to finding what I could take from those exercises. And it was like that, you know, layering effect. And I think to me that's... You know, some of the best coaches are, you know, able to do that where they, they don't come up and say, okay, this is everything that you need, but they can lead you slowly. And, and sometimes you do need to be, you know, shifted out of your mindset. And, you know, I look back and I think of the person I was when I first walked into his office and then, you know, the person I was when I got to the games. And, you know, he also just planted the seeds of lots of different things for then me to go out and explore. Mm. And... I think those lessons are, you know, they're a lot more solid when you get to do that yourself and you're not just barked at to told what to do, but you actually discover them for yourself and it makes you a lot, a, lot, a better person and particularly a better athlete. Mm. 